Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to Tuesday Night, Talking Away the Taboo. I am thrilled to be bringing you my friend and my colleague in this space, but also someone who has been through her own journey of infertility, both primary and secondary, and she's gonna talk all about it here. We are gonna be focusing on secondary infertility because that is the topic that we're talking about during the week, but she she has an, incred an incredible story and I can't wait to bring her on. So here she is, let me grab her. Drop your questions here in the chat if you have any specific questions for Keshet. She also, she's gonna give her own bio, but she is also, here she is. Hi. She is the CEO and executive director. I, 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 I'm definitely botching up your title. So I think I basically should stop I'll talking <laughs> <laughs> and just let you talk and introduce yourself. So everybody, this is Keshet. Keshet, say hi as you're adjusting and we're all adjusting here. It's all good. Oh, aren't we all? It's like the story of my life, adjusting phone angles. But hi, everyone. And as I say with my first name, I respond to many variations. So that goes for, <laughs> for work. When you have a, a name like Kesha, you got to roll with things. So uh, <laughs> that's how I work. <laughs> okay, so tell everybody, like, let, let's do the formal introductions. I mean, yes, like, everybody, like, I put out your bio, but, but tell people who you are. Absolutely. So hi, everyone. I'm Keshet. And um, as Amy said, I'm the CEO of Aura. We work with Agunote. And I'm a lawyer by training, writer, speaker, activist. And I also have a lot of love for the fertility space because as Amy mentioned, I've been through my own experience and a lot of uh, ups and downs in this area that um, I know we're going to get into today. So having spaces like this has meant so much to me and it's extra meaningful when I get to be part of this. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so let's let's jump right into this. So I, you know, you and I met each other a gazillion years ago, let's call it. But I remember the first time that I specifically knew that you were going through some sort of fertility stuff Yes, she is an inspiration. Um, that you were going through some sort of fertility stuff was when you published a piece with Layers with um, with Shira Shankin Leps and with Rachel Herkman. So can you walk us through, and, and that piece did talk about secondary infertility, but can you walk us through like the beginning of the story and then the impetus for you to want to start sharing? Absolutely. So I'll start all the way back at the beginning, which is in college when I was dealing with, I, I don't even remember what it was at the time, but I remember with the student health system getting diagnosed with PCOS, which for those of you who don't know, it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. Amy's the, the doctor in the chat, so uh, you can probably explain it better than I can, but it basically means that you don't ovulate regularly. You can go many, many months without ovulating at all. So having PCOS kind of automatically means that, well, I don't want to say that it means fertility will be a challenge for everyone, but because it impacts ovulation, there's a close relationship with fertility. And so I knew from a really young age that infertility might be something I deal with. I am, it was a lot to carry when I was like 18 or 19, however old I was when I found out. But I was also really glad to know because I got help years earlier than I think I would have otherwise if I didn't know that there was an actual condition that might be explaining why it was difficult. And then when I started, and, to, oh, hold yeah. on, I'm going to stop you for a second. What do you mean by you got help very early on? What is what does that mean? Because there are people here and people who are going to yeah. listen to this afterwards, who are going to want to know who, who may also be having having difficulty with their periods, they're going to want to know what they should do. So what did you do? So I, when I was having, okay, so when I was having difficulty with my periods and I was single and I was not looking to have kids, I went on birth control just to kind of regulate my body. And that was the solution at that point. 
then I, I might have, I'm trying to think, I might have gone off birth control and tried for maybe two months. But I, at that point already, even though I was very young and had only been trying two months, went and found myself a fertility specialist because I knew that I had this ovulation issue and I knew that I had never had regular periods ever. And so I kind of figured if you're only getting two periods a year, that's probably not helpful in terms of being ready to have kids. So okay. I got help very early on in that process. And initially, you know, I remember thinking at the time that it wasn't such a big deal. You take a couple pills and then you ovulate. And then, you know, nine months later, there's a, there's a little baby. Like and magic, right? Like exactly. magic. So spoiler alert, um, that is not what happened. It didn't go that way. And if anything, I think in some ways, the fact that I was so young was also a challenge because my doctor didn't want me to get hyperstimulated or to have quintuplets or anything like that. So I kept not responding and not responding and not responding. In the middle of that, we also figured out that I had a thyroid issue. That took time to address. But it was really sort of this very slow process because my doctors didn't want to give me lots and lots, you know, higher doses of medication and then have me overreact, which meant that I was on these very kind of slow and steady doses that just took a long time. And it ended up taking about three years for me to get pregnant with my first. And in all that time, I think I ovulated twice. Wow. Wow. Yes. So my body was like out to lunch. Whatever they were doing, my body was like, oh, nope, <laughs> you know, over my head, not responding. And so that was a very long period. And again, I, what's hard as well, and I know for listeners who are in it or have been there, you get this. Three years, if someone had told me at the beginning it would have been three years, I would have found like great projects to keep myself occupied and it would have been much easier. But in the moment, it's just month after month after month of getting nowhere, kind of banging your head against a wall and not knowing how long it's going to take. And really this sense of just limbo. I felt like I couldn't make decisions. I couldn't. At one point, it was a really great time to buy a house just in terms of mortgage rates. And I felt like I couldn't put money into a house because I didn't know how much it would cost me to have a baby. And I needed to have that money liquid in case I needed to use it for IVF. So just this sense of limbo of not knowing and of watching kind of friend after friend sort of cross over to the other side, you know, into parenting and still being in that kind of young couple mode long after I was really wanting to be there. And then finally, and feel free to fill in anything I'm kind of skipping over, eventually we found a protocol that worked. It was a combination of Clomid, which stimulates ovulation, actually glucose medication, because PCOS can come with insulin issues, um, diet adjustments, you know, um, I'm trying to think HCG injections at very specific points throughout the cycle, and an IUI. Wow. And I made the decision, I'll share this also just in case it's helpful to anyone listening, I made the decision at some point in the middle of that three-year process to kind of separate intimacy from fertility because it was adding so much stress to that part of my relationship. And so I only used IUIs. I really tried to like keep it at the doctor's office and keep my relationship with my spouse private and more up to my own moods as opposed totally. to, you know, it must be today at four o'clock. And so that made a big difference for me. Oh, okay, so now now that you brought that up, I'm actually going to take you back just for a second because I think that this is relevant to so many people who also have some kind of diagnosis when they're younger and then don't know how yes. dating, should and like any of that, those things are going to go. What, what did you tell? When did you tell? And what did your then future spouse and or I don't know if there were other I don't know about your dating life. So I don't know if there were other people who knew about that also. And then, you know, what what happened and how did you make those decisions? And what did then your now husband say? All such good questions. I definitely spoke about it with my rabbi. 
I only shared when it was very serious. So I didn't share early on. I shared when it was like, not like right when we were getting engaged, but when it was sort of at that point where you feel like, okay, I could really see myself with this person. Right. I shared that I had this diagnosis. Here's what the diagnosis is that I don't really know what the future holds, but that having kids is probably not going to be that simple and easy for me. Um, it was definitely a hard conversation and my husband thought about it and he spoke to his rabbi and I'm really fortunate that, I mean, I think, I guess I'm biased, but that he got very good advice, which is that we kind of never know what life brings us. And it can be a mistake to go into a relationship being like, oh, there's no obvious problem. So naturally, you know, everything's going to work out great that you don't know that it's and I think he also might have researched the diagnosis, but it's a pretty common diagnosis. Many, many people have this, um, that it's not insurmountable and that, yes, it might be a challenge that you have to face, but you're going to have to face challenges regardless. It might not be this one. It might be something else, but there's going to be something. And so I think we were fortunate. It was stressful. It was really scary to share it. And it was really scary in those first few days where I didn't know if he was going to be okay with it or not. Right. I wouldn't have felt right probably going further. It was sort of at the point where I would have felt strange going further if I didn't share. Right. Um, and yeah, part of you almost wishes you didn't know so you didn't have anything to share. But I'm still glad in retrospect that I knew. And, and again, I think we went in prepared that it might be challenging. We definitely did not realize how challenging. Um, so that, that was new. But we knew that it might be a possibility. Okay, so now take us forward. You're, and, and I really, I, I, I wanted to like also go back and just like, just for a second, um, just emphasize the point you made about the waiting mm -hmm. and the limbo, about how if like, and, and this is the key for all fertility issues. Hold on one second. I'm getting some feedback, I realize. Do you have, is there anything else that's, that you have on? I just wanna. I don't think so. Can okay. you hear me okay? I can hear you perfect. It's when I talk, I'm hearing the feedback. Oh, I think it's actually better now. Okay. Okay. Let's. We'll I moved try. it a little further from my computer just in case. So okay. Okay. okay, perfect. So, you know, the piece about the waiting and the limbo, that I think is the real crux of all fertility issues, right? Like, like it's exactly as you said like you would have taken on a new project taken on like some other thing like we all we all would have done so much with that time if we just knew that we would be having kids or I, I'm gonna say like and you and I are in very blessed positions because we had yeah. struggles and then we did have success at the end whereas for other people some people go through lots of struggles and then make the decision, it's not working, and they're done, right? And I think, like, it's that limbo period of, I'm trying and trying and trying and trying. If I just knew what the end would be, then there wouldn't be so much angst in the middle, and it could have been used in a different way. So I, I th that is, like, if you would have one line, you know, about the fertility issues, like, any fertility journey, that's it. That's yeah. It. That's I it. think that is so true. Okay, so let's now move forward. So yes. you're blessed. Thank God you have a boy or girl. I have a little girl. My first. Little girl. And you finally figured out the special sauce. It was the this plus the this plus the this plus the this plus the this and all the other things thrown in the middle. And so then what happens? So then I figure I'm going to leave myself a long runway to have my second child since it took three years to have my first. I start trying when my oldest was just a little bit over one and it works on the second try. Same protocol, same combination of medication, treatments, you know, this on this day and this on that day. Um, my first two are 22 months apart, which was a, a whirlwind on its own because I sort of left this long period of time that I didn't end up needing. And I really felt at that point that sort of my fertility issues had kind of been solved. Like I figured out the solution. Yep. And when I was ready to have my third, this time it actually worked on the first try. 
And it was still a whole to do because I planned the entire schedule so that I wouldn't ovulate over Pesach. And in the end, I did. And it was crazy. But still, it was a crazy few weeks. And I so I had a, a boy for my second and then I had a little girl as my third. And I really felt at this point like, okay, it takes work and time to have a baby but it's like a commitment of a couple of weeks where it's intense and the injections and it's not fun and then I get pregnant and I kind of switch back to the OB and continue with that process yep. so then when I was ready to have my fourth I actually didn't leave myself a long window I you know had three kids I you know my role had changed at work I was busy with other things I waited till my youngest was probably around three to try thinking at this point you know, this is going to be short. I even specifically started trying in the summer because uh, we do a lot of programming at Aura. It's quieter over the summer. So I figured this is perfect. By fall, I'll be back, you know, with the uh, obstetrician and pregnant again. And it just didn't work. We tried the formula and it was sort of like input output. Like you keep getting the error message. It, I probably had, I want to say four or five failed rounds each with the same sort of magic protocol that had worked every time before. I didn't understand why, my doctor didn't understand why. I think this happens often with fertility. It's kind of amazing how much we don't know about fertility. Totally. There's a lot that we know, but I think often when you go to your doctor, they're like, yeah, this should have worked. Don't really know why it hasn't. I was right. a few years older. I didn't know if something had just like my eggs had deteriorated. I didn't know if maybe something had happened in my last birth that had changed my body, that it suddenly wasn't working anymore. And for basically about between 18 months and two years, it's a little fuzzy, I probably had eight or nine failed IUIs. Wow. I had three miscarriages, okay. two very, very early, like so early that if I hadn't been trying, I don't think I would have known. And one where I did get the like you're pregnant phone call and then started bleeding soon after and my beta level started going down. And by the end of a week, it was pretty clear that I was miscarrying. At that point, I'm I had so a sorry. DNC. Thank you. I had a DNC also to remove a polyp that had been there, thinking that maybe the DNC would kind of clear everything out and I'd be able to get pregnant after that. Then right after the DNC, probably about a week or two, pandemic hit. So all fertility treatments were paused. So by the time I had waited the amount of time I needed to after the miscarriage, there was no fertility treatment happening. After, I think it was a good five or six months where things were pretty frozen and then it started up again slowly. At that point, we figured, okay, let's try the... Uh, try the magic formula again, and maybe after the DNC it'll work. And it, again, a failed cycle, another early miscarriage. And at that point, I made the decision to do IVF. IVF in some ways would have been the obvious option. I'm also really fortunate to have insurance coverage for it, um, which is a game changer. And so totally people should get that. Um, but I was really, I stayed away from IVF partly because I went to a really small solo practice where they don't do IVF. And so I would have had to switch doctors, which I was nervous to do. And I think a big barrier for me was that I kept thinking it's crazy to do IVF to have a fourth baby. And that was sort of a big barrier for me throughout the process because I already had three kids. And when you have a history of infertility, you've used you know technology to have every single child, that's a big family. And I felt, I felt kind of greedy, wanting more when I had so much. I felt guilty that I was taking away time and resources from my existing family to try and have this baby. Um, I felt a real sense of, you know, being in my mid thirties, having a fertility issue. Like, yes, I mean, anything can happen, but given my history, I don't know if like trying to get pregnant when I'm you know, really at the older end would have made sense. And so it very much felt like final, like either I do this or I don't. And this is my family size. And I kind of had this epiphany at one point where I just sort of said, like, you know what, if other people think it's crazy, okay, they could think that, you know, I'm sure there are people who do. Um, but it's my body and my money and my time. 
And if I want to do it, like I can do it. I don't have to sort of tell myself that I can't. And I think I also had a lot of fear that in some ways I felt like sort of using a gambling example, but I don't really know that much about gambling. But IVF <laughs> is like, that's not like, what game is this? I don't know. <laughs> IVF is like the big guns, you know? That's really like getting serious. And if you try it and it doesn't work, where do you go from there? So as long as you keep doing IUIs, you kind of know that, okay, if I really get serious, I can do IVF. And there was something really scary about actually doing IVF and finding out if it was going to work or not and how many cycles would I do and all those other factors. So I really just resisted for a long time. And then it was, I chose to do it eventually, partly because I had been having all these miscarriages and I wanted to know if I was miscarrying healthy babies or if my body was creating, you know, fetuses that weren't healthy and that's why I was losing them. And with IVF, you have the chance to actually find out if the embryos are healthy or not before you put them in. So I thought it would be very helpful to know that. And, and this sounds a little crazy, but logistically, um, this was still the pandemic. Getting to see my beloved doctor in Manhattan when I live in New Jersey was a huge pain. And so it was kind of also a good chance in a way. And I have to say, I, there were many downsides to doing IVF during COVID. It was very stressful because you had to test at multiple points throughout the cycle. And if you tested positive, all your hard work That's was for it. nothing. Right which was terrifying. And given my crazy schedule and kids and work, the fact that I had no, no sort of like event that wasn't on Zoom really helped. I was able to go to monitoring every day to do the retrievals and the transfers with like relatively minimal stress and chaos, even though there was a lot going on. So at that point, again, I did the IVF process and it all took a while because, you know, this is life. So, of course, uh, the day before my retrieval, I get a call from my clinic that there was a really bad summer storm and the clinic lost power. So I had to go to a separate clinic. And then we had to, like, sign all these forms to allow the embryos to move from the clinic where they had been harvested to the other clinic. And I didn't realize this at the time, but it's like a camp bus. So until everyone signs their <laughs> forms, like none of the embryos are going anywhere. So it was like a four month IVF, IVF cycle. But yes, it was amazing. But eventually we did, you know, so I did a frozen transfer and um, it transferred one embryo and it took. So even then in retrospect, you know, yeah, that was intense. It was a 